This morning we find ourselves in the Gospel of John, not Mark. We will return to Mark uh, soon, but John chapter 6 is where we will be this morning. John 6, verses 35 to 40. This is God's inerrant and infallible word. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that as we come now to the focus of the service of worship, where your word is proclaimed, Lord, that your people here would see this word as what it really is, not the word of man, not my word, not the word of the Apostle John, but the living word of Jesus Christ that endures forever. Use your word, Lord, we pray, to build us up in our most holy faith, to encourage us in the gospel, to assure us of your love, which has been poured out and demonstrated in Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. Well, friends, this passage is one that so clearly sets before us the identity and the mission of Jesus Christ. Uh, the context, if you uh, are familiar with this passage, John chapter 6, the context, context rather, shows us that Jesus is having a conversation with a crowd of Jews who are quite obviously uh, skeptical of his claims. Uh, what does he claim? Well, he claims to be God in the flesh, and yet they're unconvinced, which is interesting because these are some of the same people uh, who he miraculously fed with bread and fish earlier in this chapter, the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, one of the purposes of Jesus' miracles was to open the eyes of the skeptic, to convince them that he is exactly who he says he is, and that his teaching, therefore, carries the authority of God. But when he fed the 5,000, the entire purpose of this miracle uh, quite obviously went over their heads, uh, these people saw it, they were amazed, they were dazzled and stunned, as any of us would be if we witnessed such a thing. But these skeptics, they were also blinded by their sin. And so they didn't grasp the, the spiritual reality of what they had just witnessed. And so after Jesus left them, they went to find him because they wanted more food, and they wanted to make him king of Israel. I'm um, obviously a guy who can just conjure up food out of thin air, he'd probably make a pretty good and powerful king, they think, and, and, and perhaps he would be good enough and powerful enough to overthrow the Romans so the Jews can retake their land. Uh, this was their thinking, and so you see they were, they were thinking really on a purely horizontal and earthly level. Uh, they're concerned more about the emptiness in their stomachs than the emptiness in their souls. Uh, they're upset because their land is occupied by an enemy force by the Romans, and yet, at the same time, they're totally oblivious to the fact that they themselves are enemies of God. That's what sin does, right? It keeps us from seeing reality. It prevents us from seeing the truth of things, especially the truth about God, about ourselves, and about our relationship with Him. These skeptics are focused exclusively on their earthly wants and not on their spiritual needs, which is the case for many who seek Jesus, isn't it? Like these Jews, many people want Jesus for all of the wrong reasons, for reasons that have absolutely nothing to do with why he came into the world. 
They turn him into something he's not because that's a Jesus that suits their desires. That's a Jesus who's shaped in our image. You see how that works. It's a Jesus who works for me, who exists to fulfill my wishes and make me happy. This is the type of Jesus that our culture loves and praises. He's a Jesus who's full of love and compassion, which really means he validates everyone's feelings and then choices. This is a Jesus who exists for man. This is the Jesus that these skeptics were seeking, a Jesus they could control and a Jesus they could shape in order to uh, mold him into to fit their disordered desires. But that's not the Jesus that the Bible gives us. The Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus who's portrayed in this passage, is the Son of God who came not to affirm us, but to seek and to save us because we are hopelessly lost without him. If Jesus came to just meet our earthly needs to make our lives better and happier, then, to be honest, he's doing a pretty terrible job. Because regardless of how good your life is, you will still suffer, and every one of us will eventually die and lose everything that we have, right? I mean, how's that for some Sunday morning encouragement? (laughs) But it's the truth, isn't it? And yet the Jews in our passage are like those today who want to mold Jesus into their own personal idol because they're invested solely in themselves and their own happiness and their own circumstances. The selfish desires of their hearts blind them to their real needs, which is a spiritually fatal mistake. That's what we're seeing in our text. But but Jesus knows this about those he's talking to. He knows they don't get it. He knows that they are far more concerned with the things of the world than the things of heaven. And so what does he do? Well, in spite of their sin, he shows them grace, right? He shows them true compassion. Not compassion as the world defines it, but compassion as God defines it. He shows compassion by telling these skeptics and all of us here this morning the truth about our sin and our need to be reconciled to God. Here Jesus reveals to you the path of salvation, and it's a path that leads directly to him. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Now, friends, what Jesus is saying here is very simple. If you're to have eternal life, you must feed upon Jesus Christ because he alone is the bread of life. There's an emptiness in your soul, Jesus says, that only he can fill. There's a spiritual hunger that you have that every human being has that we're all born with that only Jesus can satisfy. I mean, haven't you felt that churning in your soul? And the dissatisfaction that comes as you try to, uh, to fill your soul with things other than Jesus. God created us for himself, for his own glory. He's the creator, and we are the creatures who are specifically designed to worship him. But in our sin, we have turned away from him to worship what? To worship created things, Romans 1 says, which is idolatry. Rather than submitting to God and allowing him to define your life and living under his holy and righteous rule, you reject him. And by rejecting him, you've literally rejected reality. And when you reject reality, you make idols out of created things. You value the things of this world more than the God who created the world. Your your ultimate allegiance is to them instead of to him. And so you look to them to do what only he can do. That is idolatry at its core. It's elevating anything in creation above your creator. And and this idolatry, the idea here of, of filling your souls with things other than Jesus, this just comes naturally to us because we're sinners. This is what we do day in and day out. I mean, maybe something works for you for a little while your idols. Maybe a job you enjoy works for a little while, or a relationship that you love, a possession you covet, a sin that you habitually indulge in. Maybe these kinds of things, you find that they inject some life into you, some excitement, some purpose for your existence, but you eventually find out what? That all of that is momentary. 
Idols are like a drug. You see, you take it, you might feel good for a little while, but then what happens? The effects wear off. Eventually that newness fades and the things that were once fresh have become stale. What does this tell you? It tells you the futility of idolatry that idols wear out. Okay? And there's, there's typically three ways that people respond when their idols wear out and fail them. One way is that you decide to work harder and invest yourself even more in your idol, hoping to recover what you've lost. Okay, but how long can anyone really keep this up? You know, how much effort can you dedicate? How much emotional investment can you make before you find yourself back in the same situation? The second response is to just jump from one idol to the next. You know, as the effects of one drug wear off, well, you just go to another one, right? When the thrill and excitement of one venture fades, you just look to something else to fill that void. And, and so with these first two avenues, you see you're, you're frantically working to fill your soul with something that matters, something that satisfies, satisfies something that, that gives you significance. But the problem is that you really never find what you're looking for. Nothing's ever good enough. Your soul is never filled. You're always coming up empty, which leads to the third response, which is despair. Eventually, you just get tired of the never-ending search. You get tired of the never-ending quest to find joy and satisfaction in the things of the world, and so you just find yourself in a deep, dark depression. You know, when the things we love and treasure wear out, these are the, the three ways that people typically respond. And it just shows you the folly of trying to solve spiritual problems, right, soul problems, with earthly solutions, with something other than Jesus. Because, because we're sinners, we are spiritually starved. And when we're starving, you know, you'll eat anything. Right? When your body is weak and in need of food, you'll content yourself with whatever you can get your hands on, and, and maybe you get by for a little while. That's what idolatry shows us, but it never, never lasts. Because just as someone who's starving needs real food, someone who's spiritually starving, whose soul is empty, will only be filled when he feeds upon that which brings true spiritual life. Jesus says to you, I am the bread of life. He is the food that you need, which means that unless you feed upon him, you will not survive. You'll continue defying the Lord who made you, consuming idols, all of these idols that the world gives to us. You'll continue to consume those things, and they bring momentary satisfaction, but you're never truly filled. You only find yourself in the end crushed. You'll find yourself crushed in the day of judgment under that immeasurable weight of God's holy wrath. That is the path of idolatry. The wages of sin is death. The Bible tells us very clearly. Idolatry leads to not only emptiness and sorrow in this life, but to an eternity of sorrow and emptiness and suffering in the life to come. But Jesus, the merciful Savior, comes to you this morning with a message of truth and a message of hope. He's the bread of eternal life who came to deliver sinners from eternal death. He's the bread who revives your soul, who satisfies your hunger in a way that nothing in the world can. And the glory of the gospel, friends, is that you don't even have to work for this bread. You don't have to work for this food. The bread of life is not a reward that is held out to those who are on their best behavior. Instead, it's freely given to those who just open their hands and receive it from Jesus in faith. If you haven't done this already, you've got to have the self-awareness to admit you're a sinner in need of grace. And when you hold out your hands to Jesus like a beggar, he promises to give you your fill. When you feed upon him in faith, your soul that was once empty is now full Though you were dead in sin, you're now alive because you fed upon what? The bread of life. You were once guilty before God, but now he's washed away all of your sins. You were once alienated from the Lord, but now you're reconciled to him. Though you were once at war with God, you now have peace with him 
through His Son, Jesus Christ. These are the eternal spiritual blessings secured by Jesus and held out to all who would receive them in faith. He promises that if you come to Him, you'll never be hungry or thirsty again because you now enjoy eternal life in fellowship with God, who is your Creator, your Redeemer, and your friend. By paying the penalty of sin on the cross and by being resurrected in power and glory, Jesus became for us what nothing else in the world can, the author and giver of everlasting life. This is the great encouragement to each of you who's trusting in Jesus this morning. You were made by him and you were made for him. He's the food that your soul was uniquely designed to crave, which means unlike the idols of the world, the food that Jesus offers never perishes, but endures forever. And so no matter what you're struggling with, allow God's word and promises here in this text, allow them to encourage you. Regardless of what happens to you here, regardless of what ails you, if you've fed upon the bread of life, you have life indeed. You have Jesus, and he has you. And this glorious gospel truth is the only sure and lasting comfort that any of us have in life and in death. Though there there may be others here who are skeptical of Jesus and skeptical of of his claims in our passage. Maybe you're one who thinks that, well, what I'm saying sounds too good to be true, or perhaps you think it just sounds ridiculous. Whatever the reason for keeping yourself away from Jesus, I want to challenge you to think seriously about all of those things that you rely on to give you purpose and and to uh, inject meaning into your life. What's your reason for living? What in this world has your utmost devotion? What, what motivates you to get up and out of bed each day? What food is fueling your soul? You know, once you figure that out, think about what Jesus says in verse 27 before our text where he says, do not work for food that perishes. If you're living for something or someone other than Jesus Christ, then you are working for food that perishes. You are enslaved to an idol, to something in this created order, and it will perish. It will constantly disappoint you. It will never be enough. It will never give you what you're searching for. And so what will you do when you finally discover that this food you're working for only leaves you empty and unsatisfied? Will you just try harder? to recover what was lost, only to lose it again and again? Will you give your heart over to something else in search of one more burst of momentary happiness and yet never finding true and lasting joy? Or maybe you'll give up the search and retreat into a dark and lonely place. These are your options. And regardless of which path you take, they all bring you to the same place. You see this place of emptiness and sorrow suffering, and ultimately eternal destruction under the wrath of God. Those who worship and live for idols will perish along with their idols. But Jesus says, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. What is this food? Well, this food is himself. Jesus is the bread of life who satisfies those who are hungry and thirsty in ways that this world never can. You were made by him and for him, which means that there's nothing in the world that can replace him. And so you need to return to him. If you have not done so, return to Jesus by forsaking your sin, committing yourself to him in faith, trusting that he is the Savior who came to deliver you from the punishment you deserve and restore you to life-giving fellowship with the Lord. As he says in verse 37, if you come to him in faith, he will never cast you out. That's the type of security that Christians have. He not only gives you eternal life, but along with that, he gives you a new purpose and a new reason for being. As your maker and your redeemer, only Jesus can give true meaning and purpose to your life, meaning and purpose that transcend all the, the temporary and perishable things of the world. Only he can redirect you 
to your true mission, to the real purpose for which you were created, which is to glorify and enjoy God forever. And so turn to Jesus, feed upon him, and live. This is the message that Jesus told the skeptics. But unfortunately, as our text says, they didn't take it to heart. Okay? Jesus makes this staggering, self-identifying claim that he is God in the flesh who's come to, to nourish sinners with eternal life. And yet verse 36 says that the crowd still don't believe him. With their own eyes and ears, they have witnessed the power and the presence of his heavenly kingdom. They have experienced firsthand the same kinds of miracles that the Old Testament saints experienced when they were fed with manna in the wilderness. And yet their hearts are still hardened and closed off to the grace of God. And Jesus tells us why this happens. Why do some eat the bread of life while others reject him? Verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And so the plain teaching of this text, friends, is, is that the Father has given some people to his Son, and they are the ones who will come to him. In other words, the crowd didn't believe in Jesus because they weren't among God's elect, at least not all of them. They weren't those chosen by the Father before the foundation of the world to receive the free gift of eternal life purchased by Christ and applied by His Spirit. Jesus says that all those elected to eternal life will come to Him. They will feed upon the bread of life. Only those given to Him will, in God's perfect timing, come to Him in faith. Jesus is talking about a very precious truth of the Gospel, one that must be handled with great care. And yet at the same time, it's one that you can't ignore and that no believer in Jesus Christ can ignore, no matter how uncomfortable it might make you feel. The doctrine of election is not only biblical, but when it's properly understood, it brings great joy and comfort and assurance to believers. An eternity passed before God spoke the world into being. He chose to grant everlasting life to some sinners, his elect and withhold it from other sinners, all according to his own sovereign purposes. Out of his own good pleasure, he, he elected some to be the objects of his divine mercy and love. He would rescue them from his judgment, cleanse them of their sins by the blood of his Son, and raise them up to newness of life by the Spirit. This act of election is God's free an unconditional choice, meaning it doesn't depend upon anything about us or anything that we do. You don't meet certain conditions or requirements in order to be chosen by God. He did not peer into the future, as, as some often say, and, and see, that, see that one day you'd do all of these wonderful things, that you would be a great person, that you'd come to Jesus all on your own, and then, and then based upon those things, that's when God decided to predestine you to eternal life. What would that mean? It would mean that you had to work to earn God's grace and that, therefore, you deserve his grace because you did this or you did that. Grace would then be this reward that God bestowed upon the worthy, upon those who did something to prompt his love, to merit it in some way. But that's nowhere in our text. And the Apostle Paul puts that whole idea to rest in Romans 9 when he says that before Jacob and Esau were born, before they had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purposes and election might stand, it was determined that the older would serve the younger. The Lord says, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And so God's choice and election has nothing to do with us meeting certain requirements or criteria that would make us then entitled to his mercy. It's not that he thinks some sinners are, are better than others. What the Bible says is that God does all things well, and that he does all things wisely, and he does all things justly, and ultimately he does all things for his own glory. And this includes electing sinners to eternal life. That's unfortunate. I think that some folks are repelled by the whole concept of election because, as it's often said, they believe it's unfair and unloving for God not to choose everyone, for the Lord not to lead everybody to the bread of life. 
They say they don't want to worship a God who does not shower his grace equally upon all sinners. And I understand this sentiment. As I said before, election and predestination, these are topics that must be handled with great care, especially since we don't know who the elect are. You don't want to be presumptuous and start condemning people who may end up turn, uh, turning to Jesus with their dying breath, just like the, the thief on the cross. And so we have to be careful how we apply these truths. At the same time, to say that God is unloving and unfair for not electing everyone is to basically charge God with sin. You're saying that he's the immoral one, and you are the moral one. You're saying that, that you can outlove God, and that if he was really just and really loving, he would do things your way, and share his grace with everyone. And I trust you can see how arrogant it is to suppose that sinners like us know more about love and justice than the Lord, who perfectly embodies those attributes. But the other huge issue with this line of reasoning is that sin is nowhere factored into the equation. If you have a problem with the idea of God sovereignly electing some to life and withholding that life from others, it's because you're assuming that human beings deserve grace when the Bible says the opposite. You have to begin with the fact that we are all guilty, hell-bound sinners. Hell is this place of divine justice. It's what we deserve. It's what God owes us because of our idolatry. Only when you get this do you see then that you, you don't have a right to anything good, including God's love. The only thing you have a right to, the only thing that's fair, is his righteous judgment. He isn't obligated to save you or me or anyone. It's essential to understand this if you're to properly differentiate between mercy and justice. And this is something our culture has gotten very, very wrong, and it's led to a lot of bad things. Mercy, by definition, is never owed. It's never deserved, because it's showing kindness to those who didn't do anything to earn it. Charitable organizations, friends, are not out there administering justice. Okay, They're administering charity to the poor and needy. They're showing mercy and compassion. Your justice, on the other hand, is owed. It is earned. Justice is what you are entitled to because justice involves getting what you deserve based upon your actions and qualifications. That's right from Romans 4, uh, verse 4. And so because everyone's a sinner, nobody has a right to God's mercy. The only thing we deserve is his justice, which means that everyone in hell deserves to be there. And everyone in heaven is only there by the grace and mercy of God. The only person who deserves to be in heaven is Jesus, because he alone is righteous in himself. And the only reason you, believer, are qualified for heaven is because Jesus has forgiven you and shared his righteousness with you. And so that the Lord chooses to elect and save anyone from his judgment is an act of pure unadulterated grace. He is not in debt to you. You are in debt to him. What's more is that Jesus highlights here the necessity of God's electing grace. He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, implying that if the Father gave no one to Jesus, then what? Then no one would come to him. Apart from the Father's predetermined choice, nobody would repent and believe the gospel. We'd all just continue uh, living our lives famished, starving in our depravity, filling ourselves with all this food, all these idols that don't satisfy until the day that we perish. And so the Lord must elect sinners, if any, are to feed upon the bread of life. And so divine election is purposeful. It's powerful. It makes salvation a certainty. Jesus is not friends, get this image out of your minds if you have it in your mind. Jesus is not crossing his fingers, just anxiously knocking on the door of people's hearts, begging to be let in. Let me in so I can save you. That's how a lot of people think that Jesus saves sinners. That is not the case. No, all those predestined to eternal life will come to him because they've been given to him by the Father. Now you might be wondering at this point, well, how do I know if I'm one of the elect? That's a common question. 
How do I know if God chose me? Well, the answer is simple. It's right in the text. Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And so, if you've come to Jesus, if you've sought earnestly the bread that only he can give, and if you've fed upon that bread in faith, then you've been chosen by the Father. Faith in Jesus Christ is the fruit of God's electing love. And so if you're trusting in Jesus, you are one of the elect. And so it really does you no good to worry then about if, if I'm elect or not. That's putting the cart before the horse. The real question is, am I trusting in Jesus to save me from my sins? Is he my only comfort in life and in death, as the Heidelberg Catechism puts it? If you can answer yes, then your life and your destiny rest securely in his hands. And so when properly understood, divine election opens your eyes to the wonders of God's amazing grace, grace that he has lavished upon undeserving sinners like us. Before he spoke the universe into being, the Father initiated his redemptive mission by choosing to not pour out his wrath upon you, but to instead make you his son or his daughter through the blood of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul encouraged the Ephesians with the same good news, saying this, In love, God predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. And so, brothers and sisters, another reason for you to be encouraged this morning is because of your Heavenly Father's electing love. If you fed upon the bread of life, then you can rest assured that the life you now enjoy is forever secure because it depends not upon you, anything about you, how good you are, how many sins you have. It doesn't depend upon any of that, but ultimately upon the unchanging promise and purpose of God. And this leads us to the rest of our passage, which is really the natural and, and logical outworking of all that Jesus has already said to you. He says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Now there's a lot going on here, but I'm going to condense it into one brief and final point. That all who fed upon the bread of life will be preserved unto glory. And Jesus has already told you that in eternity past, the Lord determined to save a people for himself. The Father gave his Son a select group of people to save who were chosen not because they were worthy, but because of God's own pleasure and glory. The Father's will is that his Son would save his people. And in the fullness of time, the Son came into this world for that express purpose. That's exactly what Jesus says here. He descended from his heavenly throne to do the will of the Father. And the Father's will is that Jesus would rescue his elect from their sins, which he successfully did by his righteous life, his sin-atoning death, his triumphant resurrection. And so the Son has accomplished your redemption, and the Spirit applied that redemption to you when he awakened you to the folly and, and really the insanity of idolatry, of repeatedly consuming idols that never satisfy. In that moment, the Spirit set before you the true bread of life, Jesus Christ, the only bread that could satisfy that eternal hunger in your soul. And the Spirit gave you the faith to feed upon Jesus and live. Friends, this is the rescue mission of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Jesus now says that all who have fed upon him will remain with him. It's the will of the Father that the Son should lose none of his people. Jesus gave his life for the elect, and he calls you to himself by the Spirit. And once you are with Jesus and, and bound to Jesus in faith, he will never lose you. He will never cast you out. God promises that all who have fed upon the bread of life will be raised up on the last day. This is commonly known as the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. And just in case there's any confusion, Jesus is crystal clear about what he's saying here in verse 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. 
That's why the perseverance of the saints is sometimes called the preservation of the saints, because God preserves all of his elect and promises to bring every last one of you home to himself in glory. Friends, if Jesus is your Savior, the life that he's given you cannot be taken away. It can't be lost. You can't do anything to jeopardize it because, as Jesus says, your eternal security depends not upon your own power, but upon his. He keeps you. He protects you. So that even though you continue to sin, sometimes grievously, if you truly belong to him, then you cannot fall away from him. In that final day, when the Son comes to gather his people, all who have died in him will be raised up. You will be resurrected, and you'll undergo a transformation just as Jesus did on the third day when he walked out of that tomb. He will bestow upon you the fullness of eternal life as he purifies your body and your soul from all of those lingering effects of your sin. You will be perfected in holiness. This is the promise that awaits the children of God. This is the rock-solid assurance that every Christian has. It's the certainty that awaits you who believe. Now, everything I've said may seem like a no-brainer to many of you, but don't take this for granted because not every church believes this and teaches this. A like election, the idea that you can lose your salvation is controversial, and yet could Jesus be any clearer here? If you can jeopardize your salvation, it would mean that he died and rose in vain. How can we say that he suffered for your sins if you can then later suffer for those same sins? It would also mean that he's not powerful enough to accomplish the Father's will and that our sin can somehow frustrate the predetermined purposes of a sovereign God. But friends, none of that's found in this text or any passage of Scripture. Jesus does not leave any room here for misinterpretation. Those the Father has chosen are those the Son has redeemed, and those the Son has redeemed are those the Spirit has called, and they cannot and will not be lost because, as Jonah declared, salvation belongs to the Lord. And so take hold of this gospel assurance because life is full of troubles that lead Christians to doubt God's saving promises all the time. There are many things that can pull you away from Christ, things that crush your spirits to the point that you think he's abandoned you. There are sins you battle with that may be choking the life out of you in this very moment, and you wonder if Jesus could ever really love a sinner like you. And the world, we know, is constantly dangling its shiny idols before your eyes, tempting you with empty promises, telling you that if you really want to live, then you need to stop following Jesus and turn to all these other things that can never truly satisfy. The world can only offer you stale and moldy bread, which will not only leaves you empty, but it makes you sick and miserable. But even though you know this, even though you know where the true bread of life is found, you, like every Christian, still struggle to be faithful to Jesus. And it's in the midst of these struggles friends, in the midst of these temptations and the trials that you face, that he speaks this extraordinary promise to you this morning that he is holding on to you through all of it, and his grip never weakens. Remember this as you come to the Lord's table this morning to feed upon the bread of life once again. Jesus meets you in his supper to reassure you of the very same promises here, that you are secure in him, that he is with you in every valley of life, and he's preserving you until that day that you are safely at home with him. And so despite all of the uncertainties in your life, go forward fully confident in what is certain, that the good work the Lord began in eternity past will be finished in the last day, when you who've had your hunger and thirst satisfied in Christ will be delivered from all of your sin and all of your suffering and raised up in glory as you finally behold your Savior, Jesus Christ, face to face. Let's pray.